georeferencing and creating data. The learning objectives today will be to create a geodatabase and some feature classes. We'll create and work with coded value domains. We'll describe and set relative paths in our map document. We'll define georeferencing as well as georeference an image. We will describe control points and use control points to georeference an image. We'll also look at three types of transformations that are available through the georeferencing toolbar in, our map, in ARC map. And we'll describe RMS error as it relates to georeferencing. So some of this you've, you've seen before, but with some of it will be a slight review. Geodatabases. We have several types of geodatabases that we can work with, with Esri products and ArcGIS in particular. With uh, the lowest level license of ArcGIS, we can only make desktop-based geodatabases. We don't work with server-based geodatabases. The two choices you have for desktop geodatabases are personal and file geodatabases. File geodatabases are preferred over personal geodatabases. Personal geodatabases have some limitations, like a file size limitation of 2 gigabytes. They're tied to the Microsoft Access format. So we've been moving away from personal geodatabases for desktop geodatabases in the last few versions of ArcGIS. We create geodatabases in our catalog. And feature classes can be created inside of the geodatabase either by importing data from other data formats like shapefiles or CAD data or we can create them from scratch. When data are imported to a geodatabase a feature class gets created. Importing data creates feature class schema or the the structure of the database, the fields, as well as it imports and creates features in the process. So you get all the fields from the existing data set as well as the features. Fields can be dropped during an import of a data set into a geodatabase. And we can also create subsets of features, select subsets of features to, to uh, only create a feature class of a subset of the selected features. That's importing. When you create feature classes from scratch, you have to specify some things. You have to tell it the feature class name. You have to define the geometry type. Is it going to store polygons, points, or lines? You have to define its spatial reference, as well as the attributes that will be stored in the feature class. Now, this is just creating the feature class. What you end up with is an empty feature class. It's a container that's ready to hold your points, lines, or polygons. Once a feature class has been created, you cannot change the geometry type or the attribute field types. So once you create a feature class that's a polygon, you can't change it to a point. So you got to make sure and get that geometry right. And the fields that you create, fields can, have certain t can hold certain types of data. They can hold numbers, they can hold text, they can hold dates. You can't change those field types either. So if you define a field type incorrectly, you have to delete that field and recreate it. You can delete attributes and you can add new ones. Domains provide a method of ensuring valid attribute values are entered into an attribute field. So they're a way of validating the information that we store in attribute tables. There are two types of domains, coded value and range domains. A coded value domain is essentially a drop-down list. So for instance, if you were doing a sidewalk survey and you had some sidewalks in a feature class, some line features that represented sidewalks, and you wanted to inventory their condition, whether it was good, fair, or poor, you can have a condition attribute and you can have a drop down list that you could pick good, fair, or poor from. And what that does is it ensures people are going to enter in the correct attributes. Well, they could enter in poor when it's good. It doesn't, it doesn't ensure that they don't pick the wrong attribute, but it ensures that there are no typos put in the field and that some people don't put good and some people put great, that it 
they put in a consistent set of attributes and, and stay, stay with the standard. So range domains specify a valid range in which an attribute can fall. They only work for number type attributes. So you could say a light pole could be between 10 feet tall and 100 feet tall. If you knew all of your, your light poles out on the campus were within a certain range, it would keep someone from putting in 1,000 feet tall by accident. So domains are specific to the geodatabase. We talked about shapefiles earlier in the semester. Shapefiles are an older GIS data format, and they are widely used. They've been around for a long time, and they're still used a lot. Domains are a big advantage of geodatabases over shapefiles. So just to be able to use domains is enough reason to use a geodatabase instead of a shapefile. Domains are a property of the geodatabase. To add one, you right-click the geodatabase and you go to Properties. Domains must be applied to a field under the Feature Class Properties. So you create a domain as a geodatabase property, and then you add it under the Feature Class Properties. So you work with them in a couple of different places. Because a domain is a property of the geodatabase, it could be applied to many different feature classes. So the condition example, good, fair, and poor. What if you're also inventorying buildings and you want to put in whether a building is good, fair, or poor? You've got a buildings feature class and a sidewalks feature class, both in the same geodatabase. You can use that conditions domain across multiple feature classes. <clears throat> a domain has to have a field type. You have to tell when you create the domain you have to specify whether it's going to be a text or a number, what kind of field type it is, and or data type. And that attribute field that you apply that domain to has to be of the same data type. Relative domains keep map documents from losing the path to a data set when a folder is moved or a drive letter designation changes. So We've talked a lot about how map documents simply point to data that exist on a hard drive or on a flash drive or on a CD or on a server. Your data exists somewhere and your map documents point to that data. So when map documents store an absolute path, it stores this drive letter, E colon backslash GIS underscore data backslash Bent Creek. It stores that full or absolute path. So if you were to move this Bent Creek folder to another location, it wouldn't be in the eGIS data folder anymore, and the paths to where that data are would break. Also, it often happens when you're working with a flash drive, especially in a school environment, when you work in here with a flash drive and you plug your flash drive in and it's, uh, it's designated the G drive in here, and then you go home and your computer when you plug in the flash drive, it gets a different drive letter. Storing relative paths doesn't store the drive letter in the path. It just stores information relative to the folder that your data and the map document are in. So it allows map documents to be portable as long as the data and the map document are stored in a consistent file structure and you're not moving things out of folders. So storing relative paths are best when you're delivering data or when you work with mobile drives on different computers and you're moving around a lot. It makes uh, GIS projects more portable. It's not the default. You actually have to go into a map document properties under the file dropdown and click this store relative paths to data sources checkbox. I'm not sure why it's not the default. I think it's been about seven years now I've been thinking that the next version of ArcGIS will make that the default, but, but they have not yet. At ArcGIS 10, there's an, a new feature called the Default Geodatabase. And what this does is it allows you to have a default location for your work from a specific map document or GIS project. So it provides quick and easy access to data in a geodatabase. 
it can be specified several ways. During the startup of ArcGIS, there's a getting started splash screen. You can set a default geodatabase there. You can right click a geodatabase and make it default in Arc Catalog. And you can also do this under the map document properties, file drop down map document properties. This gives a default location for, for processing output to go, for exported feature classes to go. It, it, you have to have, it, it used to be when you exported something, it went to the C temp folder and it created a shape file. Now you can specify a default geodatabase. There is a default geodatabase created automatically. It's in your Windows users folder under the ArcGIS folder and things will get dumped to that without people realizing where it's going. So you have to pay attention to where your data is getting put when you geoprocess data or export data and know that there is that default geodatabase always and if you're all of a sudden you can't find something it probably got sent to that it's kind of like a default default geodatabase which is kind of a weird term but but there's a default default geodatabase. Um, it's easy to access using your default geodatabase button. Oftentimes we get data that does not have real world coordinates associated with it yet. Georeferencing is one way to assign real world coordinates to raster data and to CAD data. It's used to align or georeference data to other spatial data. Georeferencing again assigns real world coordinates to data sets. And georeferencing data allows it to be viewed, queried, and analyzed with other geographic data. There are some steps in georeferencing, and we'll see those later in this class. In ArcMap, the first thing you do is add the raster data set or CAD data that you want to align with your projected data. In our exercise in this class, we work with raster data. So I'll talk about raster data mostly, but the process is the same for CAD data. In our, a subsequent class, we do a bunch of work with CAD data. After you add the raster data set, you have to add control points that link the known raster data set positions that are not in real world to known positions that are in real world map coordinates. From there, you save the georeferencing information when you're satisfied with the alignment. It's also referred to as registration. And you do this using the update georeferencing command in the georeferencing toolbar. <clears throat> you can permanently transform the raster data set as well, but this is optional. Raster data sets are georeferenced using existing spatial data that resides in the desired map coordinate system. In our exercise this morning, we're going to be working with some data that's stored in state plane, North Carolina feet. And we will be aligning a raster data set to match our state plane coordinates. The data with the desired coordinates we refer to as target data. Often a vector feature class may be I'm not sure what that means. Often a vector feature class, but maybe, a, oh, it can be a vector feature class, but we typically are working with raster data. So this process involves a series of ground control points. They're known as XY coordinates that link locations of the raster data set with locations of the spatially referenced data or the target data. Control points are the locations that can be accurately identified on the raster data set and in real world coordinates. So what you have to do is identify a location on your raster data set that you want to georeference. And you have to be able to identify that same location on your target layer that has real world coordinates. So basically you're saying this road intersection or this corner of a building or this light pole on my raster data set, I can identify that feature on my target layer and I can tell what real world coordinates that road intersection has. The control points are used to build a polynomial transformation that will shift the raster data sets from its existing location to the spatially correct location. 
the connection between a control point on the raster data, the from point, and the co corresponding control point on the target data is called a link. So here you can see in this example, this is the raster data in the background, and they've got this road intersection. And this raster data doesn't have real world coordinates. So what they're doing is they're clicking a control point right there at the road intersection, and they're saying this location on the raster data set that does not have real world coordinates is actually this location on our target data, which in this case is a roads vector data set. The first control point you pick is on the unknown location. The second control point you pick is on the known location. This is the georeferencing toolbar. You'll work with it in class. There's a georeferencing dropdown. Here's the update georeferencing that I mentioned. You can also flip or rotate your image. There's different ways to transform it here that we'll talk about a little bit. You can delete control points, reset the transformation. <clears throat> this drop-down identifies the CAD data or the image that you want to georeference. This is how you work with control points and you can see your links here. <clears throat> Note the transformation types here. There are several types of transformations you can perform. The first order or a fine transformation simply takes a raster data set or a CAD data set and what it does is it moves that CAD data set to real world coordinates. It can rotate the raster data set and it can scale the raster data set. Okay. These other two will not only move the raster data set, scale it, rotate it, but will warp it to make it fit an area. So again that first order or a fine transformation will shift, scale, rotate a raster data set it's used for maps that don't require much distortion during the transformation. It requires a minimum of three links and it's the most common type of transformation used. In our example with Bent Creek, we're going to be working with a, we're going to be georeferencing a 1 to 24,000 topo map. So that topo map represents the real world well it doesn't require a lot of stretching and you just really need to move it and rotate it and put it where it is. When you put in more than three links it introduces errors or residuals that get distributed throughout all the links. So more than three links are recommended because if one link is positionally wrong it'll have a greater impact on the transformation. Once you put in that fourth, it'll distribute the error throughout all the links. Even though the mathematical transformation error may increase as you create more links, the overall accuracy of the transformation will increase as well. With second and third order transformations, you use with raster data sets that must be bent or curved in addition to shifted, scaled, and rotated. Second order requires six control points and third order requires ten control points. There are higher level transformations than third order. They're rarely needed. Splining is an example of a higher level transformation. In graduate school the maps that I worked with were from the 1700s and they were copies of copies of copies of copies of maps that were found in the basement of some uh, courthouse somewhere. They didn't represent the real world very well, so we had to actually stretch and make those things fit the real world today. So that's an example of when you might use a, a higher level transformation with a really old map that, that just doesn't, was not built uh, with the same kind of methods that we have in, in mapping today. 
So when you put in that fourth control point and you get an error, it's referred to as a root mean square error. This is the difference between where the point ended up as a potion as opposed to the actual location that was specified a lot of people look at the root mean square error and they think it's the error in on the ground of of your data it's not the error on the ground it's it's the difference in where you click and where the software is able to 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 uh, position it based on your other links the total error is commuted by taking the root mean square or the sum of all residuals to compute the RMS error. This value describes how consistent the transformation is between the different control points. When the error is particularly large, you can remove and add control points to adjust the error. So if you've got one that's not that's adding a lot of error, you can take it out and add a different one. We uh, typically put in a fourth one in our exercise just to see an error when you're when you're working with this the first order transformations you can put in three and again the USGS topo map is real accurate and it's real accurate compared to what we're georeferencing it against you can put in two control points for this thing and it'll look pretty close we're gonna work with four so that you can see the error and see how that works Storing georeferencing information with raster data, you can do it in a couple of different ways. Some raster data sets, like aerial photographs, they store the georeferencing information in a header file. So it's part of the image. Okay? A geotiff is an image that stores <coughs> referencing information in the image. A lot of images don't store it in the image like a JPEG. We're going to be georeferencing a JPEG today. Everybody's familiar with a JPEG, probably. It's a scanned map. Okay, we're going to be georeferencing that. And we're going to save the georeferencing information in a separate file that's called a world file. And it's a separate ASCII type text file that stores georeferencing information. The way it works is you've got your image like mytown.tiff and when you update georeferencing in the georeferencing toolbar it creates a world file and it names it the same thing mytown mytown dot there's different naming conventions and this is actually wrong there's no I there tfw is a tiff world file a jpegw is jpw JPEG world file. SID files, which is a image format that's kind of specific to GIS and remote sensing, has a SDW file. So oftentimes when you download aerial photographs from a county or the state, it comes as a zip file and you unzip it and you see the photo dot extension and then another name dot with an extension with the W. The software ArcGIS and most GIS software, when you load this TIFF file into ArcMap, if there's another file named the same thing with that extension, it looks at that file and it uses it to display it in the right location. It's a real simple text file. It basically stores those from and to coordinates from the control points. We used to build these text files by hand all the time, not too terribly long ago before they had this georeferencing toolbar that did it for us. They were real easy to build. Um, now we uh, use a georeferencing toolbar and the update georeferencing command. 